Well, hello, uh, Imhotep, and welcome. I'm Mog Morgan, and this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. I'm talking about Margaret Murray, uh, who's a famous Egyptologist, focusing on her material that is of interest f from a magical point of view for those into Egypt. She's also quite well known, some would say notorious as a, a folklorist, because during the First World War, when the libraries were shut and probably wasn't able to go on into the field to do the Egyptology, she kind of got into a second interest, which was uh, British folklore. She wrote a number of very famous books in their time about witchcraft in Britain. Although since then, in the last, I suppose, 30 years, a lot of her work has been downgraded or even discredited, some would say. Certainly her, her views on witchcraft, although she was a, thought of as a great authority on witchcraft in her day, are not taken as seriously. And in some ways, maybe this has a kind of uh, an effect on, on how they see her Egyptology, although in the Egyptology side of things, then maybe he was vaguely aware of this problem with her, her folklore interest. Lots of Egyptologists of, her, of the day, including her teacher Petrie, were also quite interested in uh, British folklore and published material on that. Uh, so it, was, it went with the territory, as it, as it were, but uh, mostly now people just look at her Egyptological work, although, as it happens, some of the folklore stuff, the folklore of Egypt, when she kind of brings them together, the folklore of Egypt, which is really what the big influence was, is actually quite interesting uh, and useful to the type of work that I'm interested in anyway. So Margaret Murray, uh, witchcraft, magic and occultism in Egypt is the, is the, the stuff that I'm going to focus on, but I'll mention a little bit about how she kind of got into this. She wrote that uh, I for, uh, someone, I forgot whom, told me that the witches had a special form of religion, for they da danced around a black goat. This is her writing in her biography, which is called My First 100 Years. She lived 100 years, just over. And this story about the uh, European witches had been told to Margaret Murray about the same time as she went on a retreat to Glastonbury. She said for the sake of her health, and she heard, uh, you could say, the call of the horn piper. The first thing she wrote when she was in Glastonbury was on the Egyptian uh, elements within what's called the Grail Romance. And if you look at those articles in which do occur in Egyptological magazines, they, they, they stand up quite well. They're quite interesting, but they're mainly about Egypt and about the Coptic religion, which she was an expert on. So after she written this thing about the Grail Romance, several years later, in fact, she, she published this groundbreaking book, The Witch Cult in Western Europe in which she made the very startling claim that the witches of Europe uh, worship Baphomet. Well, almost. As any Egyptologist would know, talk of a black goat immediately suggests the myth of the famous goat of Mendes in, in Egypt, Mendes being the Greek name for Jadet, which is a place in the Egyptian delta where they worshipped the god Amun, whose name means the mysterious one, which is rather good. Amun was actually a ram rather than a goat, although that confusion was common even in the classical world to confuse, even though they knew the difference between goats and rams. Uh, in terms of mythology or travellers tales of the time in the classical Roman world, they often confused the two. 
I'll show you a picture of Baphomet, in case you've forgotten what he looks like. Baphomet is... Most of the material I, I, I think on Baphomet, the best material, it, it still comes from uh, Julian Vane and Nicky Weir's, Weir's book, The uh, Book of Baphomet. It's this kind of strange uh, androgynous image, sort of a uh, goat-headed uh, deity with horns and, uh, you know, making a strange gesture with, with wings, as I say, androgynous, cloven hooves sitting on a globe, I suppose you would say. There was a claim that in, in the book I mentioned, Julian Vane and Nicky Weir's book, Book of Baphomet, they, they do quite a good thing on that on the history right from the beginning of the cult of Baphomet in the Middle Ages, I, I suppose, the accusation anyway that people worshipped, the Knights Templar worshipped them, to the idea that the Freemasons worshipped uh, Baphomet. And there were these pictures which turned out to be fakes of the Baph uh, of the Freemasons in France worshipping this kind of... Uh, this strange figure of the, the Baphometic goat, which you can see from the picture. And in the first edition of Gerald Gardner's The Meaning of Witchcraft in the 1950s, which is a kind of groundbreaking book in terms of the revival of uh, pagan witchcraft in, in, in Britain, the, the the cover the first cover of that book actually as well also has a picture of Baphomet. So the idea that Baphomet and the witches they were worship worshiping them uh, worshiping this goat-headed deity in the middle ages it's difficult to say how much of that is true and how much of it is kind of what you would call urban legend and the legend of it is contributed by Margaret Murray's work really as well so as I say, you, the model, one possible model anyway, is, is not completely obvious, for the goat of Mendes or Baphomet is, is the Egyptian god Amun. Mm. Now I should tell you a little bit about Murray herself. Uh, she began studying Egyptology on her own account in 1894. I should say that it wasn't that common uh, at that date for women to be admitted to do degrees in these sort of subjects in in British universities, strange as it might seem. But even so, within a very short time, it was acknowledged in publications, she was acknowledged in other people's publications, such as her teacher, Flinders Petrie, that, you know, that she was actually working on uh, sites within Egypt, including the very famous site of uh, Nagada, which was discovered by Petrie uh, and was a, a, an ancient city and lots of other amazing discoveries. I suppose at that time there was so much open field, uh, so many things still to be discovered. Um, this is in the kind of last bit of the 1890s and, and all the rest. This is before the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. So I don't know if she ever actually did a degree, which is one of the things that people throw at her now, saying she wasn't that qualified. But she, you know, there were difficulties about her studying for, formally for the degree. And Flinders Petrie taught her anyway. And she was obviously thought of as, as, as quite a... a a live wire because he wrote a book and was teaching the Coptic language within the university fairly early on. So if you come forward a quarter of a century uh, when the Great War, as they sometimes call it, the First World War, uh, was over and Murray was able in the summer of 1921 to return to Upper Egypt and stay with the local mayor in Nagada, which is where this amazing discovery was perhaps we'll talk about in another recording because there's an awful lot to talk about just that which was uh, a, known as a Coptic town uh, it was dominated by the Coptic religion it was a major centre of the Coptic religion in uh, Egypt and it was famous as I say for the discovery by Petrie who, who's also famous as the fa known as the father of, uh, of archaeology 
So Murray was there pr probably, or all these things together meant that she was an expert on Coptic Christianity and taught that language at the uh, University College in London. What, what Petrie had discovered at Nagada was a, an ancient citadel of a lost city, which initially, this is the strange thing, they didn't recognise. It was so strange, if you like, the stuff that they found. They thought, oh, this is not Egyptians, this is some sort of new race. So he had to, he's obsessed with this idea of new races and things. And if you think about... If, if you're familiar with uh, Margaret Murray's work, this idea of different races and lost races and all the rest, in her second book, which is called uh, On Witchcraft, rather, which is called The God of the Witches, she speculates that the witches had a certain eth ethnicity, a special racial group almost, descendants of, she said, of the, the little people or descendants of the fairies. And I, I guess it is true that there's some sort of interplay between a belief in fairies and accusations of of witchcraft in the Middle Ages in, and later times in, in, in Britain. So she was sort of on the right track. It, it's not a kind of completely preposterous way of looking at things. But her teacher, Flinders Petrie, he turned out to be mistaken about the idea of Nagada being the home of a new race. The occupants of the citadel at Nagada were the original uh, Egyptians, the original indigenous Egyptians, although a different variation on, on the cult, culture which was sort of people thought was more well known. And, and that's an interesting lesson in itself, that Egyptian culture is not some monolithic thing there were, there were obviously variations within it and as is well known they <coughs> turned out to be followers of the god set or seth who some later times saw as the archetype of the devil uh, and coincidentally the 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 witch trials the inquisitors inquisitors in the European witch trials often accuse the witches of worshipping the devil. So it's funny how all these different elements got mixed up. They've they found a god in Egypt, uh, which became the seemed to be the archetype of the devil in later times. So this is very very ancient stuff. And she studied the witches, and the witches were accused of also witch, uh, worshipping the devil. So. I think it's fairly clear that her Egyptology and her folklore were kind of mixed up. And maybe this, in a good way, maybe in a good way, or in a way that wouldn't be uncommon, that people would look for traces of Egyptian religion from the Pharaonic times within European folklore. That, that would be a, a thing to do, and that is a very contentious issue in its own right. So while she was staying at Nagada, uh, doing her field work uh, and, and discovering more things and, and getting to know the Coptic people, she was actually uh, bitten by a, a, a feral black dog. And if you're interested in folklore and magic and just Egyptology, People tend to be a little bit superstitious, really, <laughs> I think. Or maybe it goes with the material. Uh, but it would be a, not an uncommon uh, incident, but certainly in that part of the world, uh, you know, where there are quite a lot of wild dogs. I mean, there are quite a lot of dog bites everywhere, but certainly it's one of the things you do notice uh, if you travel in uh, the country areas of Egypt and the cities, in fact, that there are quite a lot of these... Uh, packs of an individual wild dogs or dogs living wild and that are of their own particular breed even it's amazing to think that she was when she was doing all this field work she was she was nearly 60 years old and what she discovered every, she, she was a great scholar in her own way whatever happened to her these personal incidents and the stuff that she was researching she was very meticulous about writing it down and uh, recording all of her personal feelings and everything that happened and 
this is again ahead of its time really there can be a tendency to kind of separate the pharaonic archaeology from the local population that are, that are there uh, but often there's a there is some sort of continuity and you can learn something about the pharaonic material from looking at how people still do things there's quite a a, a a continuation someone thinks that murray was dismissive of, of magic itself so she was skeptical about magic but uh i don't know certainly in her egyptological stuff she she isn't skeptical and certainly in her encounters with the local population where once you get outside of the kind of cosmopolitan Cairo area, it uh, is quite sort of magic is in definitely in the air. So her article about what happened to her is fascinating and uh, erudite. And the second sentence reads that uh, with typical understatement, you know, uh, you can imagine what's going on ahead. She, she talks about how many people die as a result of dog bites within uh, Egypt. She says it's not huge, well it is, it's 15% which, so it's not 100% fatal, but that's, that's still quite a scary prospect, especially if the dog is mad, i.e. rabid, and that is not uncommon as well, especially more common then. The, the interesting thing that came from this uh, dog bite was that the locals offered her a, a ceremony, offered a piece of magic to deal with the uh, effect of the dog bite and, and to make sure that she didn't succumb to some sort of... Uh, well, the thing is they speculate whether she would from the rabies or also from the kind of psychological effect of a, of a, jo a dog bite in, in that circumstances. Which again is very unusual that people seemed aware of the possibilities really and they had a whole ritual structure in place to deal with with this incident. Uh, it must have occurred to her that uh, when people were talking about the, the, the magical impact of dog bites she, she must have known about this important god Anubis who is in some mythologies a kind of nemesis of Set whose citadel she is exploring. So being exploring this citadel with Set and you're bitten by a dog it would bring to mind a magical the association with the goddess Anubis or even with Set himself, it would almost be like you've you've breached a taboo in some way. So, plus there's this idea that dog bites there have this psychosomatic element to them, where you 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 may get rabies, but you you may just as dangerous, sometimes more dangerous, is a thing called uh, false rabies. <laughs> yeah. Which is the kind of fear of it. The fear of it is more deadly in some ways than the than than the kind of disease itself, which may, you you probably haven't got, but just the fear of it might kill you, or might drive you mad, or into some sort of nervous breakdown. This is obviously she's she's understating it, but it's obviously having an impact on her. She, she writes in, in her in her diary, you know, within a few months, symptoms resembling the true disease may manifest. You may become irritable and depressed. Uh, he may say that that is serious, and you may just go mad. You may have some sort of fit or whatever, be unable to drink. Just the fear of it, you start manifesting the symptoms, even though it. There's, there's no, your temperature hasn't actually gone up and you don't actually have the disease. So this is kind of magical stuff going on here. Uh, 
in connection you can see why the locals kind of be aware of this would kind of offer to help her out because they've obviously seen this sort of thing happen before strange things do happen there so although the wound is only a small wound apparently she was shaken up she was sufficiently shaken up that she took the suggestion of this special ritual which is known as the Anbar Tarabo uh, Seriously, she accepted. She said, yeah, maybe we should. You could say maybe she kind of thought it would be interesting anyway to see this ritual taking place. They chose a special site for it to do the ritual. So it's, it's a big deal. Uh, they chose an abandoned Coptic church. But they started off there, but that didn't kind of work out so well. So in the end, they went to the home of a local Muslim because even though it's a Coptic city it's it's a mixed city the Muslims and uh, Coptic Christians there and he wanted he had a big nice big house presumably and uh, whatever and he wanted to witness the whole thing as well it was just very interesting and as it happened most of the the village wanted to come and see it as well because it's quite a, a, a spectacle quite a special thing so she wrote uh, about this in her biography, uh, which is published, my edition anyway, in 1963, when she was 100 years old. And that, there's a shortened version, but there's a much longer version of it, which was published in uh, the 1920s in an article in an early magazine called Ancient Egypt, which was the house journal of the University College London. As I say, the, the, the rite required the presence of four Christians, in which she said she counted herself as one, even though she was the victim. It is said, right, the rumour that she was, even though she may have counted herself as a Christian, later times she had a reputation for being a bit stroppy or for actually cursing people herself. She cursed other people, so it is said. And uh, people have seen letters in which uh, she kind of, it, there's an account of, of, you know, of her cursing colleagues usually. She could certainly get very angry with colleagues about certain things. Uh, also present at the right, as I say, was the, the village headman, the kind of the Omda, and two Coptic priests as well. The same right would also be offered to anybody, regardless of their religion or no religion, and Muslims would get exactly the same right, and the same people have to be present. So the right Anba Tariba is supposedly named after a Coptic saint, although other than that, that name, there's nothing known about them and so it, it seems likely that the name is really comes from somewhere else you can look at the biography of the saint offered along with the ritual which you know is quite long you know you think it must be real but but one has to remember that this is really a magical technique and in a magical technique which we can learn, you learn quite a lot about Egyptian magic and about contemporary magic from the way they go about this. You always have to have a story, the so-called historiola, uh, the kind of history, semi-history type thing. For in order for some of these sort of rituals to work, you have to have a, a story of where it had worked before or what, how the ritual came into existence in the first place. And if you've got that, you can read that and, and that tells you why you're doing the things you do, the ritual actions, and that somehow makes it more efficacious. Uh, this is a very common element of uh, ritual material from the pharaonic world, from the classical world. It's an Egyptian idea uh, that you have to have a story, you have to have this full, full story and there's some amazing examples of these kind of activating stories really which you read out loud before you do a ritual and that tells you how the how uh, it tells you how a lot of things work 
within Egyptian magic, even quite complicated rituals. That you had to have a place, you had to have a story, and then you have to have a, maybe some things that you make, some substances, and then you have to have some ritual act. All these elements have got to be there in some form or another, and sometimes you just need the story. The story is enough. So an obvious parallel, which is not explored by uh, Margaret Murray, is that Amber is just another name of Anubis, a dog. The hieroglyphic name of Anubis is very, very close, Amber, which is the name of the Coptic rite, to the name Anpu, which is the name you would pronounce, the way you would pronounce the name Anubis within the Egyptian language. Same goes for the words of power that are used within the rite once it gets going. In her recollection, she could only remember uh, a rather odd phrase, which is bash, bash, stana, which she didn't recognise at the time as Coptic or Arabic. But if you're familiar with the, this book, the uh, PGM, the Papyrus Greci Magicae, which is an ancient collection of Egyptian magic, currently the object of a great deal of uh, interest and study in the magical community and the academic community, then there's, there's a word or a phrase, an Aramaic phrase, that occurs in the uh, PGM, which is Basim, Basim, Amba. And that kind of fits with what she remembers. So maybe it was Aramaic and the PGM is, is very multilingual document full of all sorts of uh, languages often within the same ritual uh, spell. So the rite is a very interesting piece of sympathetic magic uh, which up till then had not really found its way, nobody had seen it, there had been accounts of it before but nobody had actually ever seen it performed in the flesh. Although it was obviously a common thing, uh, or not uncommon, it happened before. There's several versions of this in, in circulation, so, but perhaps for a Westerner or a scholar to actually observe it taking place, that, that was quite an unusual thing. You might call that immersive anthropology in the fact that she's the actual subject of the ritual. It's one of the most popular rituals to have survived from antiquity, judging by the number of examples and references to it. There's even a copy of it in the Vatican Library. And it shows the continual rel relevance of ancient rituals from centres such as Egypt to which the global West remains connected in all sorts of unacknowledged ways. We might say that what is useful tends to survive. The rite, as I say, is described in several sources of the Coptic religion. Perhaps not often said when people talk about Murray, they usually call her an Egyptologist, which she was. But she was also, right to recall, she was also an expert on Coptic Christianity and she taught at UCL. That was what she really taught. And the book that she, the primer and uh, the reader that she put together for the Coptic language is still in use. It's still on the open shelves in the, in the Bodleian. Coptic institutions usually have a very intimate relationship with the, uh, the previous pharaonic culture, Egyptian culture. They're the kind of successors or survivors of uh, the Egyptians. One good example of this is a, is a thing called the Flower of Life, which adorns the uh, a building, a subterranean building called the Osirion, which was actually discovered by Margaret Murray at Abydos in another field of work that she worked all over Egypt. And she would have known that the Flower of Life is a Coptic meditational device or image. And you can see a whole bunch of these in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. Uh, but there are several of them situated on the walls of the Asarion, which is a pharaonic building in Egypt, because a lot of pharaonic buildings were re 
tasks as churches. They were to convert it into churches and, mon and monasteries. As I say, the Coptic Church is the largest Christian group in the Middle East at the moment. It seems to differ uh, from Byzantine or Roman Church, uh, Greek Church, on very, very minor grounds that is too difficult to work it out or talk about it. It's, it's there, the experts know. It's a very small doctrinal difference between the two churches. The interesting that thing, I guess, is that the Coptic Church is the origin of what you would call monasticism within the West. In the Irish Gaelic, there are many examples of the name, uh, with, with an institution they called a desert or desert, really, which means the hermitage or the desert. So it's likely that the Celtic monastic tradition has some sort of connection with the Coptic Church as well. The, the cells and institutions used by Coptic monks are often built in or out of uh, pharaonic remains, such as the Monastery of Jeremiah, uh, built into the valley temple of, of uh, one of the pharaohs at Saqqara. Most of that you can now see in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, which is an amazing place to visit. The picture there is uh, of the two dog saints, interestingly, of the, at Saqqara in the Coptic Church. <laughs> Another amazing subject is the incidence of dog saints sort of half dog, half person, like Anubis, I suppose, within the Coptic Church. I wondered if there was something, have a reading all this, in Coptic Christianity, which determines its attitude to magic and witchcraft. It's, it's often said there's no witchcraft trials in Egypt, in the, in the way that they're kind of known everywhere else. You don't seem to get that, really that sort of satanic witch thing. We, we, you know, who are pretty much the victims in the, the European witch craze. Witch so does Coptic Christian have, which has also been an influence on the British attitude to witchcraft, remembering that the first Christian missionaries to the British Isles and Ireland were Coptic, so maybe the Irish thing is, I think there's not very many witch trials within Ireland. Maybe that's the influence of the Coptic Church and the missionaries there. Uh, as I say, the Copts, in many sense, the Coptic people were, are the original Egyptians uh, and preserve many aspects of the Pharaonic culture. And people, the Egyptologists, have learned a lot from the comparison how to pronounce, for instance, the Egyptian words would be much more difficult without the assistance of kind of cancelled in antiquity and but the Coptic language even though it changed itself in order to distance itself from the pagan world it still kind of preserves a lot of the pronunciations and it's been an important way in which people have reconstructed the pharaonic language certainly this is in terms of the word heka which we we tr translate as magic which is an incredibly important topic within pharaonic culture. This word Heka survives within the Coptic language as well, used for the same thing. So magic survives in their practices, as you would might say even within the Catholic Church that has a, a magical aspect to it, which in the high church anyway, you know, I mean, we just had the coronation in Britain and people were very interested in the, the, the magical elements within that, which seemed quite archaic and, but also quite fascinating. But as, as I said, the church reformed, it, it, it ditched a lot of its magical stuff and, and ended up, in fact, persecuting 
magicians and, and witches. So the question of the presence and absence of witches is a complicated issue. Uh, and you could look at the work of uh, Ronald Hutton on, on that, Professor Ronald Hutton, who's, who's defined what a kind of witch might be and um, why they inspire such fear. But you won't get many of the things that, uh, like the evil witch and uh, the kind of tradition of witchcraft and the use of uncanny means, you won't get it quite in the same way within Egypt. But although there definitely were groups of practitioners of magic, uh, which you wonder why they weren't sort of singled out as witches if they'd have been practicing like that even now within um, uh, European tradition, they certainly would have been accused of witchcraft and persecuted for that. One of the interesting things that connects us back to this incident with Margaret Murray, of course, is that the people say why witchcraft is not so um, much an accusation or completely absent as an accusation in Egypt. It is a, there's a theory that's connected with uh, a thing called the evil eye. The evil eye, the idea of uh, using the eye or the eye as a possible way of... Uh, causing that so the evil eye if in europe there it's certainly in britain rather than ireland the the idea that you might accidentally have a kind of curse someone or jinx them in some way people always said oh it would be deliberate and they kind of punish you for that in in the Egyptian tradition, we sat, and in the Middle East, where there's a stronger tradition of the middle eye, uh, of the evil eye, people kind of accept it as just p part of the nature of the world. Really, it could be even accidental. You just can't help it that these things happen. You you may have ways of uh, avoiding it, but it won't necessarily involve you in the same kind of idea. Or they've deliberately given me a bad look, or whatever. So a witch then is someone who causes harm by uncanny means. And as I say, this never really crosses anybody's mind in, in Egypt. This is kind of surprising. I've, I, I think maybe under the influence of the West that people have this more. It's, but it, it would always be on a, a smaller scale. It would be a, a, a local dispute, really. Nothing like the kind of panic that you get in Europe. And anyway, there are lots of techniques from Arabic, Coptic, Pharaonic sources for for dealing with this in a in a in a more rational way, I'd say, in a magical way. You do read in some areas of trials by ordeal amongst the Bedouin people, which is the nearest you could get to it. I mean, that, that's an unusual thing. So people who were accused of theft might uh, opt for a kind of magical experiment to kind of prove their innocence, which is quite extraordinary. I, I've, I've written down here, it's sort of an island, so the, the uh, alternative is, is a, it doesn't mean that the women aren't oppressed, like I, I know the majority of witches were, were, well, probably were women, but they weren't all women. But, but whatever. There's, there's certainly a kind of battle of the sexes element to it in the the, the witch trials. And, and maybe the in in Ireland they don't have it quite like that, but they still have a sort of a, a different way of get of getting at women. They accuse them of of other things. Okay, so go, better get back, not get too distracted. Fascinating subject. So thinking about Margaret Murray again in 1921, just back in Egypt, having written her most famous book about witches, not about Egypt. This is the book, The Witch Cult in Western Europe, and it was going to be just about to be published. I checked that. It was just a, it just arrived in the Bodley, and, and, and then she gets back to, to Egypt after, you know, everything's going well, and what happens? She gets bitten by a black dog. 
I think she would have seen that as incredibly significant. You Nobody could avoid it. It's like those chance encounters she'd had, apparently years ago in back in Glastonbury when she was searching for the witches. So she starts writing about that. Uh, if I go on a, a little bit of a, a digression that uh, on the issue of witchcraft in Egypt, which is something of a kind of specialism of mine, the, you, there isn't, there's a sort of word for it. Uh, there's an ancient pharaonic term of the awet, or, or ah, which is translated by another famous Egyptologist, uh, I.E.S. Edwards, uh, 1960s, as warlock or witch. So it's possible that there is this class of uh, folk practitioner in, uh, in, well, they're definitely there now, but I think they've probably always been there. Was it, you know, did he say that this is in the 1960s because he'd read Margaret Murray? You never know where, where these ideas come from, even with an Egyptologist. Even a, a scientific scholarly person can pick up on a trend of the time and think, oh, well, that's an interesting way of doing it. I'll, I'll put it in. It is true, though, if you look at a thing from the Persian period, there's, there's this thing called uh, an amuletic decree or, or an oracular amuletic decree. And this is folk magic in Egypt from very, very ancient times. And it's like a lot of magic. It's there to protect the newborn baby, right, which is sort of particularly vulnerable to spirits and demons and just you know it's a dangerous time being born and all this sort of stuff and in the amuletic decrees which are very very interesting things it does actually say we'll keep her is for the one example is for a, a girl we'll keep her safe uh from the from the magic of the warlock and from the magic of the witch, that's how they translate it, and from all magic of every kind. So the idea is that this little amulet that is given to babies or put on their sleeping places, their cribs or whatever, is there to protect them from witchcraft. It means literally that word men or women of the voice. Men or women who have a particular voice. They have the power of the voice. And you can see how that might translate as male witch or female witch. This idea that the, the words that you use can have this magical impact and can be quite dangerous to those who are, are vulnerable. So as I say, it opens up this possibility that there are certain men and women in Egypt who, who have certain innate abilities or perhaps they, they they can train for that it could be intentional as i say it could be unintentional and they have this ability to utter spells or perhaps just the words they use the unintentional can cause harm and you can't but think if you know anything about egyptian magic that it's very much entangled in this web of language and of of words of getting the words right or getting the words wrong or mangling the words you use this thing that is essential element of magic uh, practiced by the gods for in first instance by kings priests ordinary people badly chosen words can cause harm and it could be the use of the voice to enchant or mesmerize uh, a person to which babies are going to be especially vulnerable for obvious reasons hence there's a whole class of objects at, uh, in existence from very very ancient times in egypt in order to kind of protect against the these these instances so it's not, uh, uh, I sort of slightly contradict to myself and say, well, there obviously is this magical stuff. I, there's a picture of the amuletic decree. I can't resist saying that the, the papyrus has survived. 
the uh, the papyrus is exactly is thought to be the length of the they measure the baby they take the measure of the baby which again is the sort of thing you hear about in european witchcraft as well they measure the baby and that and then they make a piece of papyrus exactly that length and then they write this kind of long protective spell upon it and then they stick it in a in a little amulet and <clears throat> put put that nearby the actual amulet in in the book i was very interested in the in the book uh, that this is published in is it uh, it makes a little drawing of the amulet which is kind of interesting with the egyptian deities on it and then they threw it away <laughs> they kept the papyrus but the actual physical artifact not being made of anything particularly valuable was discarded and in my time studying this material in archives and and all and with librarians and all the rest it's not an uncommon thing that material connected with folk magic is maybe recorded if you're lucky and it but may not even bother translating the, the, the whole thing. It's, the, it's only recently that people have taken an interest in translating some of these stuff rather than just saying, oh, well, it's a, just a piece of magic, forget it. Uh, it's not important, uh, missing a trick. But the actual object itself, the piece of material culture, will actually be discarded. So that's why people think that the history of witchcraft and the history of magic is it's got problems really because of some of the kind of weird things that the early scholars scholars uh their own prejudices they had tremendous lot of prejudices and puritanical attitude which we we kind of don't have so much now but you can see in the record that uh, the kind of things that they do I mean I, I suppose you could always point it out when they talk about people like myself or you know kind of independent scholarly types practicing and <coughs> researching match it it's easy to point at them and say well look at the things that has happened in your in the in the official record the things that have been destroyed or mistranslated or garbled there so an awful lot of stuff has to be redone. Uh, I've probably got a lot more to say about this subject and I, I, I think I'm going to end on a, a, a short bit before I had a, a second part because rather than rush this through, there's such a lot of rich material that Margaret Murray uh, uncovered in connection with this uh, magical folk tradition within Egypt and it's something that I'm particularly interested in in a sense of specialism is to look at the folk tradition there and to connect it with the pharaonic one and use it as a way of throwing some light on uh, this tradition that we want to revive or also, it's kind of people will say, "Well, it's it died, so you can't revive it." They often criticise pagans for reviving stuff that <clears throat> died out years ago and they've got no connection with, and they don't know all the secrets. But then you discover that actually it hasn't died out. There probably is a continuous tradition, and there are guides in existence to this. So we'll we'll come back to it in a second bit. I'll I'll just finish by saying that. In the, as you, you know, serendipity really, I think you have to use a bit. Looking at uh, the articles that Margaret Murray wrote in this uh, ancient defunct journal, Ancient Egypt, I think they only did a couple of dozen editions and then it, it, it finished. And probably taken over by another, did another kind of academic journal. She writes about the Coptic ritual new year which actually has a persian name not an egyptian name it's called Nowruz, which means uh, new year so it's like all these different traditions are, are mixed up 
but this points to the fact that these are continuations of ancient festivals, which is the importance of looking at uh, Margaret Murray's material and other folklorist material on Egypt and the, this blend of the two. It's connected with uh, with the rise of the Nile, with the inundation, a very important time, obviously, within Egyptian uh, cosmology and culture. So she writes a little article about it, and Petrie kind of puts a little editorial note on it, reminds her that this, this term, the Nehru's, and the Persian terms, is also applied to a local magical cult known as the Tsar. And it's obvious from the, this little interchange between Petrie and uh, Margaret Murray, a student, that they're fairly familiar with this cult, uh, which was only really first encountered by Western travellers who, who, who again didn't really know what they were seeing. So uh, there's another film on the, in, in the collection now of uh, from the Egyptian Magic podcast on, on the Tsar cult, if you want to know a little bit about that just to show the difficulties of even researching this aspect of it is that when it was first described by prof a professor, a learned professor, but of course he, he's a, also a Christian missionary in Cairo, and he says, look, within 30 years, uh, I've come to know that all through the Islamic world there is uh, an observance a type of ritual that is exactly the same, he says, Professor, as the black mass within Christendom. That is a saying, say, a profound parody of the sacred service. So we're coming back to Baphomet, really. So this is 19... He lived 1963 to 1943. He was a professor of God knows what. But he, he's able to say that they practice the black mass in Egypt, in the Islamic community. So, yeah, I don't know, take this with a pinch of salt. But this is, they're talking about a magical exorcism tradition that has survived from Egypt into the Coptic and the just the general population. But this is what we have to navigate around, the... Um, I suppose you say the prejudice and the bias of of these. So I've got a little bit just to wind up. So next time, I'll I'll go in great detail about Margaret, what Margaret Murray has discovered in terms of this amazing surviving magical ritual, and the effect it has on her. Uh, and as I say, I do refer you to the Tsar cult. Ma Murray says that whenever a woman is inflicted by any illness, uh, the Tsar is, is usually blamed. Uh, and people go around the houses, you go on a Saturday, a Tuesday, a Thursday, and there'll be women and, and girls in the house of a sick person uh, drinking beer uh, and practicing this ritual. So it's very interesting, it's good to observe this sort of stuff. So she was kind of involved with the ritual, which is a little bit like a sour ritual, but a bit like a pharaonic one as well, which is what we're going to look at. So join me next time and we'll look at Margaret Murray's adventures in the magical world of uh, folk country e Egypt. Thank you for listening.